As Quebec prepares to pass a law allowing assisted suicide, and with a B.C. case almost sure to make its way to the Supreme Court, the right to die debate has made it back into the national conversation. Joining us now for more on that debate, in Montreal, Quebec, Margaret Somerville, ethicist at the Center for Medicine, Ethics and Law at McGill University, and with us here in studio, Wayne Sumner, Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at the University of Toronto. Uh, Margaret, good to have you back on the program out of Montreal. Wayne, nice Thank to have you, you here as nice well. Nice to be here. Thank you. Well, as we suggested, this debate is uh, renewed again with considerable vigor right now. And let's start in the province of Quebec, where they've got a bill before the National Assembly that would allow doctors to help their patients die under certain circumstances. Wayne, to you first. What do you believe this law, this proposed law, does well? Well, the first thing I think it does well is to make some provision for our patients who need it to have uh, a, a medically assisted death. Um, palliative medicine can do many wonderful things, but everyone knows that there are um, some minority of cases in which even the best resources that are currently available in palliative care cannot eliminate all suffering at the end of life. And for those cases, um, uh, patients need something more. In jurisdictions in which uh, assisted suicide or euthanasia, any form of medically assisted dying, um, are already legal, we know that there will always be a relatively small minority of patients who will elect that option when confronted with the, the suffering that they're otherwise um, scheduled to uh, experience at the end of life. What the Quebec bill does is to provide them with that option. Margaret Somerville, you obviously are in Quebec. You presented before the National Assembly uh, a committee that was looking at uh, this bill. It's called Bill 52. What did you tell them about the bill? Well, the first point I made, Steve, was that if, um, like the Supreme Court of Canada in the Rodriguez case, and as I also believe, it's inherently wrong to, in to intentionally kill another person, uh, then Bill 52, that's what that authorises. It will authorise physicians to give lethal injections to patients. And so Bill 52 is really, it accepts that as a given and then it's guidelines for the management of how do you do that and in what circumstances and who will be able to have access. And despite what Wayne said that you know it would be relatively restricted to a few people who are in desperate need, Certainly that won't be the case under Bill 52. For a start, you don't have to be uh, terminally ill to have it. Uh, you can have just mental illness, not physical illness. And with respect to whether your pain and suffering is intolerable, Bill 52 makes that uh, just a decision by the patient, that the patient finds it intolerable. Moreover, you can have refused all suffering or pain relief measures, and you can still have access saying that you've got intolerable pain or suffering. So Bill 52 is extremely wide in what it would allow and who it would allow to have access to euthanasia. Margaret Somerville does not believe your suggestion, Wayne, that a tiny minority would be affected by this. She seems to think it's more. I guess it depends on, on how you define a tiny minority. Um, Bill 52, and Margot's quite correct about its, its provisions, maps in many ways the provisions that have already been in place in, in the Netherlands now for, well, more than 20 years under one form or another, but a little over a decade under actually uh, statute law there. And uh, the number of deaths that occur within the provisions of the, the euthanasia law in the Netherlands every year is approximately 2% of all deaths in the Netherlands in that same year. So we are talking about very... Are you sure very... about that, Wayne? I think it's gone up to 4%. No, it's gone up a little over 2%, not, very, not much over 2%, but it's still, whether it's 2% or 4% is immaterial here, it's still um, a very small minority of overall deaths. And the other side of this, just for talking numbers, the number of patients who opt for either an assisted suicide or, a, or euthanasia is very small relative to those who opt to decline life-sustaining treatment and accelerate their deaths um, by declining any further treatment that would prolong their lives. Um, those numbers are enormous compared to the number that actually elect an, an, an assisted death. Margaret? But, but Wayne, um, the rate of use of what the Quebec bill calls terminal palliative sedation, that is you deeply sedate the person and withhold all food and fluids and so they die. 
The rate of that in the Netherlands increased last year. We've just got the figures for this by 13%. Yes. And there's concern in the Netherlands that, that this terminal palliative of sedation is being used instead of euthanasia. And one of the reasons for that, and this would also be true under Bill 52, is that the reporting requirements and the access to it requirements don't, that are true for euthanasia don't apply to terminal palliative sedation. Moreover, whether a person can have it seems to be here under Bill 52 at the discretion of the doctor and most importantly, a surrogate decision maker can consent to that, whereas that's not true if we're talking about euthanasia. And you know, the other thing about this is that when you argue that such a small number of people need it, and I believe we can handle their cases in merciful ways other than killing them, then why are, all the, why are the people so promoting euthanasia when it's such a radical change to the ethos and ethics of medicine and to our most important societal values, respect for life? I mean, it doesn't make sense. You've either got to say, well, these are the values we espouse and this is why we want it. Let me but follow up on that say, question, well, it's actually. It's just a tiny number of cases. Right. I don't think that's a good argument. You, you've asked a good question, and let's, let's see if we can get an answer here, because the, Hippocrat the Hippocratic Oath, which admittedly is not law, it's, a, it's an oath that doctors take. Not all but, doctors even take it, so. Well, but the doc, okay, but doctors do, do no harm is right. number one. Yes. And if you're helping kill somebody, the argument is you're certainly doing harm. Uh, that would be the argument, but I would completely disagree that in a case in which a patient has requested either euthanasia or a physician-assisted suicide in order to escape what the patient himself or herself regards as intolerable suffering, that you're not harming the patient, you're helping the patient. So I don't think there's any violation of Hippocratic Oath for whatever weight that has in uh, crossing the line to um, medically assisted dying in the sense of assisted suicide or euthanasia. Um, I know that, uh, that uh, Dr. Somerville thinks that there is and should be a bright line between the other measures that are available to patients at the end of life, many of which will also hasten their death, and um, these measures. But I simply disagree that there's any ethically bright line there, and most people um, I think agree with me. And Margaret Somerville, let me put the flip side of the question can, to you. Can I just is, answer first, Steve, please, about okay. the Hippocratic Oath? Because okay. I think that's really important. If we look at the history of the Hippocratic Oath, it's two and a half thousand years that it's guided what we regard as the ethical practice of medicine by physicians. And the Hippocratic Oath was so such a radical development at the time it was first formulated because we had in, what we had as humans was medicine men. And medicine men, and we still see this among some uh, ethnic communities, that they were both the healer and the killer in the society. And what the Hippocratic Oath did, it separated those two roles. And it said from now on, physicians will only be healers. They will not be killers. And what this sort of law does is it reverses that two and a half thousand year old principle and value. Okay, and I that, hear you. That's but very I, important. I, I hear you, but now the next question then becomes, so what do you want to do about it? Do you want to put doctors in jail who are helping, in their view, put people out of their misery? If they're breaching the law, yes, but the most doctors who are helping people out of their misery are not breaching the law. You see, uh, Wayne raised this, that we disagree. I think that there's an absolute right to refuse all treatment, including a life support treatment, which might mean you'll die sooner, you probably will, than you otherwise would. That is not euthanasia and that is perfectly legal and ethical. I'm also a absolute advocate of total pain management. In fact, I believe it's a breach of human rights to leave someone in pain. It is possible that in some un unusual cases, and particularly if the doctors don't know what they're doing with respect to proper pain management, to get the pain under control, you might use a dose that could shorten the life of the person. But your primary intention is not to take the person's life, it's to take away the pain. And so that makes a difference. And I know that Wayne will argue, as the pro-euthanasia people do, well, the intention doesn't make any difference, or even if it did, you can't tell what a person's intention is. Okay, but I'm going to give you a chance. But on the other hand, I'm our whole criminal law is based on what was your intention. I'm, I'm going to give Wayne Sumner a chance to come back on that in a second, because we are going to talk pain management in a second. But I don't want to let the time get away from us here without making sure we've covered Quebec. We need to cover Donald Lowe now. 
Mm -hmm. The Donald Lowe video uh, reignited this debate in a massive way. He, of course, the highly respected microbiologist, worked at Mount Sinai Hospital, uh, issued a video just a little bit before he died uh, because he wasn't happy with, he said he wasn't afraid of dying, but he was afraid of the kind of death he was experiencing. Uh, let's play a clip of that video and we'll come back and chat. Roll tape, please. I'm just frustrated not being able to have control of my own life, not being able to make the decision for myself when enough is enough. You know, we've come far enough. It's time to, to bring it to an end. And I really envy countries like Switzerland and the Netherlands and the United States where this is possible. I mean, why... Why make people suffer for no reason when there's an alternative? I just don't understand it. What impact do you think, Wayne, that video has had on the national debate today? Well, Donald Lowe speaks with considerable authority in many people's minds because of the prominent role he played in the SARS um, uh, debate here in, in Toronto 10 years ago. Um, I think it resonates with a lot of people. Um, I think it's particularly um, resonant for them to hear a doctor um, voicing these kinds of views. Um, many uh, physicians have been opposed to any kind of physician-assisted death. Um, this, is, this is gradually changing. I think he speaks with um, particular authority because he's speaking as a member of the medical community and he's speaking about his own case and he's articulating um, basically I think what are the two basic um, considerations in favor of um, allowing physician assisted dying first of all it allows individuals to exercise more control a higher degree of control over their own dying process and that's that's one thing that Dr. Lowe clearly wanted to be able to do in his own case, to determine how his dying was going to go, determine how his death was going to happen. The other was the issue of suffering. And uh, I think a law that um, stands in the way of someone um, opting for what they themselves think will be the most effective way of alleviating or preventing um, further suffering is simply cruel. I think it violates a basic tenet of a decent society, I mean, compassion for those who are badly off, compassion for those who are suffering. Okay, let me get to Margaret then with the, with the other side. This is, this is not, I mean, one of the reasons why this video clearly has had such an impact, Margaret, is that this is not, um, this is not an emotional person who, who is coming to this issue late in life. This is a person who's a medical person who has thought a lot about the issue, who is making a rational case. How do you tell him he has to face the kind of death he faced rather than something which, in his view, would have been more humane. Well, Steve, don't, you know, Dr. Lowe's video is the strongest possible case you can make for euthanasia, and it's heart-wrenching. I mean, he thinks that's what he wants. I mean, what we don't know is what other support he had, what kind of palliative care he had. Um, Dr. Balfour Mount, who's the founder of palliative care in Canada, he, he wrote to me about this and said there were a whole heap of questions that he had about it, and I think we'd have to know that. But even, I mean, there's a concept called moral regret, and what it says is that I understand what you want and I, I can empathize with you and think how you must feel, but with this regret, because I believe it would be unethical and because I believe that instituting this in general would, would do serious harm to values, for example, to the medical profession. Uh, I can't go along with what you want, but what that does place on us is an obligation to do everything that we can within the limits of ethics and law to help people like Dr. Lowe. And the person who knows most about this in Canada is Dr. Harvey Max Chochinov, who's a psychiatrist in Manitoba who specializes in psychiatry of dying people. And we've got to have that sort of assistance available for people like Dr. Lowe. But I mean, it's a, it's a heart-wrenching case. But I could also say to you, I've just seen a film called End Credits, which is the filming of two people in Belgium 
uh, who did or didn't want euthanasia, but it, it's certainly not a pro, an anti-euthanasia film. If anything, my understanding is it was meant to be a pro-euthanasia film. But in that, you see a similar video of a 34-year-old depressed woman, very young, and no physical illness, and she wants euthanasia, and the doctor goes ahead and, and gives it to her. And you see her lying there on the couch, and she dies. I mean, it's absolutely horrific in my view and so we could show that sort of film which is the same sort of approach to how do we put our arguments as we're seeing from Dr. Lowe and I'm not meaning to uh, sort of demote in any way the courage and the passion and the sincerity with which he asks for that. No, I understand and let's actually let's put another submission on the list here because uh, last month in the National Post their religion reporter Chris Lewis uh, spoke about his own very painful experience recovering from a spinal problem and I'll read a little excerpt from his piece that he wrote. He said, I spent nearly 15 months in agonizing pain from a severe spinal problem and just this week returned to work, something I doubted I would ever do. Massive doses of morphine could not quell the pain completely. Even after having surgery in November to fix my screwed up spine, I still spent many agonizing months feeling as if I was undergoing the cruelest form of torture. I never considered suicide but I was convinced that the pain would massacre me. I am now doing much better, but there is a very good chance I will live on small doses of morphine for many more months or years and depend on a cane. I will not be hiking or cycling anytime soon. These were things I once imagined constituted my quality of life. Today, not being in agony is enough. I never would have believed that I could have dealt with such a horrible situation, but I did. Here's the question, Wayne, for you. Could a government-sanctioned assisted death, assisted suicide, call it what you want, nudge people into making what ultimately could be the wrong decision? I don't see how. I mean, what in, in, in this case, he, he made a personal decision, made a personal choice, which, of course, I respect. He made the choice that he regarded as best for him. But the whole point of providing a legal option for physician-assisted dying is to allow people to make those choices, to provide them with another option. How providing them with a further end-of-life option can make them worse off or nudge them toward it as opposed to the existing options, um, I simply don't see. It seems to me it's, it's, it's simply more respectful of uh, personal choice, exactly the kind of personal choice that he made. Um, but on the part of those who elect a different option. But I think part of what he's getting at is that there will be people in his circumstance who when faced with the same kind of unbearable pain he was faced with, which he decided to ride through, uh, will say, I can't take this, I'd rather have death, but they don't see the long range picture, which is 15 months later, he's right. hanging in there. Right. Now, I think I mean, you're one, right, one thing, Steve. Hang on a sec, Mark, I'm going to wait on this. One, one thing to keep in mind, is that where um, physician-assisted dying is legal, one of the provisions that um, is required is that the, the patient be um, afflicted with an incurable disease, that so there be no prospect of, of medical treatment which is actually going to make things better. And in those jurisdictions, about 80 to 85 percent of patients who opt for a physician-assisted death are terminal cancer patients. They're not going to get better. He had the prospect that he could, if he, if he was able to get through this uh, agonizing uh, interval in his life, he had some prospect of improvement at so the, that makes a the end of it. That makes a difference. I don't think he would even qualify um, within the, uh, the terms of Margaret, the, you wanted to say? the legal regime. Well, Charlie Lewis, I think, he, I think it does make a difference to uh, the people like him. Uh, we know, for example, that when people are first quadriplegic, they'll often say they want to die. But after they've accommodated to their situation, they say, well, I'm really glad I didn't do that. They can still find life worthwhile. And you don't have to um, be dying uh, to have, or even to be physically ill, to have access to physician-assisted death, or I like to call it euthanasia. 
Um, but you have to have an in incurable the Netherlands disease. Or Belgium. You, it's enough if you, if you say you've got an incurable illness. Well, diabetes is an incurable illness. Depression is an incurable illness. There's, probably most of us have got some incurable illness that we either know or don't know about. Um, and one of the things that is worrying about this kind of uh, legislation is that what it says is that death is a suitable treatment for uh, suffering. And that's exactly the opposite message from what the suicide prevention people want to give. And actually, Bill 52 is interesting because it probably doesn't authorize physician-assisted suicide. And if you read the reports behind it, that is probably because the Quebec government is worried about giving a message that if you're suffering, it's okay to kill yourself. Okay, Moreover, if you said that was true, if you brought a person who'd attempted suicide into the hospital, then the argument would be, well, you shouldn't treat them. They've got a right to do this. With just a few minutes left, I want to try and tackle two more things. And I want to first start to make the comparison to abortion which I'm not saying obviously is not a controversial issue anymore, but it's not as controversial as it once was. Uh, we've had no abortion law in the country for 25 years, and there are, I suppose, plenty of public opinion surveys which suggest that for a great chunk of the population, this issue is settled. Not for everybody, obviously, but for a great chunk. And I wonder, Wayne, whether you think, if you make an analogy to abortion, we're in the same place when it comes to the euthanasia debate. I think we're getting there. Of course, we haven't changed the law. Um, and so there's no new legal regime for medically assisted dying for people to sort of get used to. Uh, if you look at jurisdictions where that did happen, for instance, say Oregon, where, where assisted suicide was legalized in, in 1997, it's now such a stable feature, stable and accepted feature of the landscape in Oregon that even Republicans in the state have to support it in order to have any chance of being elected to, to office. Um, people get you know, they, 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 they come around to um, throwing support behind a regime once it's in place and they see that it works well. The same has happened in the, in the Netherlands. I think public opinion, public opinion has been on side for legalizing medically assisted dying for some time in this Let in me this get country. Margaret's view on this, which, which is, uh, go ahead. Well, in actual fact, Steve, um, we have reached some, you're right, we have reached some consensus on abortion, but it's not the one that's reflected in mm. the law. What the surveys show is that around 64 to 67% of Canadians believe that there should be a law on abortion and that at the latest it should apply at viability of the fetus and the Canadian Medical Association defines that as 20 weeks gestation. But our law doesn't reflect what that consensus is. And parliamentarians and don't want so to wade in on this either. Pardon? Parliamentarians also don't want to wade in on this either. They're, as far as they're concerned, it's settled. Well, I don't think that's correct, but um, you well, know, there's just, a lot of people I'm going who by don't the think it's settled. I'm just going well, by I the mean, evidence, which is in 25 years, nobody's advanced anything on it. We've had in Parliament. We've had two motions, so that hardly indicates that the issue is settled. But even the Conservative yeah. government, where you think they, they, uh, they might actually have a principled interest in reopening the abortion debate, know that it's political suicide to do it. Yeah. Let me get this, let me, we literally down to a minute and a half here, and I've got to obviously make mention of the fact that yesterday in British Columbia, there was a court of appeals decision, which Margaret was a victory for your side. They said that mm -hmm. the, um, they said that- One the of the rare ones, Steve. One of the rare ones, okay. Well, uh, <laughs> it, very it's, not welcome. A it's not a victory yet, because of course everybody assumes that the, the court of appeal, which overruled a lower court judge, that judge opening the door uh, to assisted suicide. Um, this is likely going to go to the Supreme Court. And I, let's finish up on this. Um, is the Supreme Court ultimately going to decide this? And if so, how? Well, the Supreme Court decided it once in 1993, very narrowly uh, upholding the, uh, what are still the current laws governing assisted, it's just assisted suicide in 93. Euthanasia wasn't on the agenda then. Um, I strongly suspect that the court will end up deciding the issue again unless federal politicians do a gut check and uh, become more willing to, uh, to open up this issue and talk about it. Got 30 seconds left, Margaret Somerville. It's all yours. Well, there was a bill before Parliament in April 2011 that would have legalized, changed the criminal code to legalize euthanasia and assisted suicide, and it was very massively voted down. I've forgotten the exact figures, but it was something like 258 people said no, and 59 or something MPs said yes. So. 
Uh, I think, oh, I mean, it will go to the Supreme Court, I'm sure, and I hope that the Supreme Court upholds its uh, previous precedent that it set in Rodriguez. Margaret Somerville from McGill University, always a pleasure having you on the program. Wayne Sumner, Professor Emeritus, University of Toronto, thank you for coming in as well today. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.